Sorry, first thing is check. It's Wednesday, February 26, 2003. This is the beginning of an interview with John Titus at the Shimon Valley Historical Society. Mr. Titus is 79 years old, having been born in Elmire, New York on October 2nd, 1923. My name is Ed Van Inwagen, and I will be the interviewer. Go. You have questions you want to ask? I, okay, I'll just say, were you drafted or did you enlist? Beg your pardon? Did you, were you drafted? No, you had to enlist no. if you were in the Marines, right? That's right. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> you were living in Elmire at the time? Yeah, one of the reasons, uh, as a matter of fact, I took an English examination at Southside High School at 8 o'clock in the morning, and at 10.30 I raised my hand in the Marine Corps. When the class graduated, I was crawling around the sand of Paris Island. Uh, if you recall, in 1941, which is when I enlisted, the United States in Elmira was just coming out of a depression, and there wasn't an overabundance of jobs around. Right. And uh, I don't know. I like the look of the Marine uniform, so I said, "Here I go." <laughs> Great. That's it. You could just go right from there. Well, I can enumerate what, 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 when I went, went to Paris Island, I stayed there 12 weeks for recruit training, and then I was transferred to the Charleston, South Carolina Navy Yard, uh, which entailed nothing but guard duty. And right after the war was declared, I was transferred to Quantico, Virginia, which at that time was a big school center for the Marine Corps. And I went through three different schools, one on camouflage, one on uh, map reading, and one on map making. Uh, the irony of the thing was, once I got sent to a division, never used it. <laughs> so as far as I'm concerned, they wasted a lot of money. <laughs> okay. But right after the, that school program, I was transferred to the 1st Marine Division, which was just organizing at the Marine Barracks, New River, North Carolina, which today is known as Camp Lejeune. And uh, we immediately went into a, a rapid training uh, program. Do you remember any of the officers? Oh, yeah. Like, manning officer, when I got there, was a captain by the name of Thomas Francis Xavier Riley, <laughs> uh, who he's now deceased, but at the end of the war, he was a lieutenant general. What was the kind of feeling at the time? Were guys really? Well, Gung -ho. scared. The Marine Corps has the innate ability to instill a little fire in you. Uh, we, uh, the landing, of course, we didn't know where we were going until we were told after we'd been out to sea for about three days. But uh, the 1st Marine Division, the bulk of it landed on Guadalcanal, August 7th of 1942. My battalion didn't get there until September, not a third or fourth, something like that. And uh, the irony of our landing is I saw some of the guys who had made the initial landing, and the first impression I had was how extremely skinny they were. On Guadalcanal, you didn't eat too well. Was there ample food, or you just... I don't know. I'll give you an example. One time, we went three days with no food. And very seldom did we get more than two meals a day. Hmm. Uh, most of the stuff we were eating was sea rations. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I, when I 
landed on Guadalcanal, I weighed 148. Five months later, I weighed 116. Oh my God. Uh, they jokingly used to say, don't turn sideways or we'll miss you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, Is that, that was, uh, Guadalcanal was a very, it was different than all the rest of them because there was so much sickness. I had malaria twice. Mm. Uh, I had diggy fever, which is a similar ailment. I didn't have that there. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the guys were, uh, we had a lot of dysentery. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had three guys in our battalion die from it. Were they taking wounded back out? Beg your pardon? Were they taking wounded out? Oh, yeah. Well, they had a field hospital, which actually they captured from the Japanese. It was like a big circus tent that was, they built right in among the coconut trees. The, uh, but the Navy was taking a terrific beating there. The Japanese were constantly bombing them. And uh, I can recall one time when the first sergeant asked me, and of course he asked everybody, how many rounds of ammunition do you have left? I had about 38. He said, give me all but 28. I said, what are we doing? Run out of ammunition? He says, close to it. And the guy that was with me says, we're like, we'll wind up in a constant, in a, in a POW camp. What was the weapon you had? But uh, fortunately, uh, such was not the case. We did take advantage of some of the stuff we captured from the Japanese. They had no end of rice, and we had rice every imaginable way you could have, baked, fried, stewed, and everything else. And their cigarettes were as good, if not better, than the ones we had. Really? Well, the government was packing cigarettes in the sea rations, and they were Chelsea's, which I had never heard of. I don't know where they got that. It must have been sweeping from the floor. Yeah. But uh, and we we were considered because of so many uh, sick members in our battalion. We were considered uh, a casual unit, and they, or casualty, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. They sent us to uh, most of the division went to Australia, but they sent our battalion to Auckland, New Zealand, which was a big break, because we were the only ones there. And uh, we stayed there for about 11 months, and uh, of course we were there about two months or less than that. We started training again. Then uh, we went back up to the islands. As a matter of fact, we went back up and stopped at Guadalcanal. We didn't stay there very long. Uh, once again, romping around in the jungles, hmm. and then we boarded ship and headed for the Marianas. Hmm. And uh, we land. Well, at first we were a floating reserve. Now we went down to Guam and watched them land there, but they didn't do anything with us. They sent us back up. The Saipan, once again, we did nothing. Then they sent us over to Tinian, which is a small island mm -hmm. just east of Saipan. And uh, there, uh, we were there probably, I'll say maybe four or five months. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a pretty clean operation because they secured that island, I'll say, in about five weeks. Huh? But that's where they built the big airstrips for the B-29s, mm -hmm. and that's where that Enola Gay took off from, the one that dropped the, uh, the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, then all attention in the Marine Corps was being focused on Iwo Jima. Thank God I missed that one. I have never met anybody that was on Iwo that hadn't been wounded. Uh, but shortly thereafter, we wound up 
going to Okinawa, there was the 1st Marine Division, mm -hmm. the, uh, now my memory is getting stretched, I know the 1st and 6th, I'm not sure if the 2nd was there, and there was a couple of Army Divisions, the 77th, the 7th, and the 27th, which was the New York State National Guard. Uh, that campaign there was much different than any other would be done because this was big time. The universe saw so much artillery. That's the first time we ever got involved in a lot of uh, tank warfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, the casualties were pretty, pretty high there. Well, the uh, when the Japanese quit. Uh, this is when they started this point system to go home. Well, I had so many points, I'd been overseas 40 months. Wow. So, there was a handful of us they took down to the airfield, put us on a plane, we're going to go back to the United States. You never saw such a rapid uh, uh, <laughs> depreciation of travel modes. We flew to uh, Guam. This was uh, in September. As a matter of fact, we were in the air when they announced that the war was over. We got to Guam, and I thought I was landing in a commercial airfield. Really? They had a desk there and everything else. I walked in, and I was the senior NCO, and I handed this uh, Army Air Corps sergeant a bunch of orders, and he says, these are no good. I said, what do you mean? He said, we're bouncing majors and lieutenant commanders off. How do you think a sergeant's going to get on? So we wound up going down and they put us on the USS Portland, which was a heavy cruiser. And we sailed that thing to Hawaii, not as passengers. We were passengers without bunks. We were sleeping on the deck and everything else. But uh, the Navy personnel were great to us. And then we got to uh, Pearl Harbor, and uh, we were there exactly one day. And all of a sudden, they load us on a truck and take us way out in the sticks. Hmm. And all of a sudden, I see this sign that said, United States Navy LST Center. I said, oh boy. An LST is like a floating bathtub. Mm -hmm. We rode that from Pearl Harbor to San Diego. My brother came Then back. we got processed there. I was a regular. I still had a couple of years to do. So what was your rank at that time? Sergeant. Mm -hmm. You know what? It took me eight years to go from sergeant to staff sergeant. Well, you couldn't make a rate after the war. Mm -hmm. and they were just non-existent unless you were a technician. And uh, so my greeting was the Marine Corps decided to send me to Paris Island as a drill instructor. And I wound up down there in the latter part of 45, 46, and part of 47. Oh my God. And then I went back there in 1950 and 51 doing the same job, which was really most recruits. are rather disdainful or they're drill instructors, but they usually respect them. But that was the toughest job I ever had in the military or in civilian life. Really? Oh, I'll tell you, you either you either produced or you were gone. And they didn't they didn't mean let you out. I can recall one time I had a little difficulty and the colonel uh, well, I was kept putting in letters to get transferred. I, mm -hmm. I, he said, I'm beginning to know your name. <laughs> and I'm saying, well, what is he trying to tell me? He said, you put one more letter in and you're going to get transferred to the Pe Palau Islands, which is about as far west as you could go. Really? Yes, sir. <laughs> that was the end of that. So, uh, during Korea, they moved the 1st Division out. They were at, still at Camp Lejeune. And uh, 
a stroke of luck, I guess, is when they, the day before they left, they came down and transferred me back to Paris Island as a drill instructor. And I said to myself later on, I said, well, that beats crawling around over there freezing to death at 40 below zero. So uh, I stayed there and uh, I got, well, I was transferred to the Brooklyn Navy Yard for a short time and then I got transferred to the Scotia Naval Supply Depot, which is right outside of Schenectady, mm -hmm. closed now. Of course, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, almost all the Navy Yards are closed. Right. And uh, so I departed with 10 years and two months in. Wow. I would have, uh, one of the things that prompted me to get out was the fact that my eldest son was uh, scalded, was in the hospital at St. Joe's for six months. And at that time, the military provided no funds for your dependents off the military reservation. The only salvation I would have had would have been to have my son sent to either St. Albans Naval Hospital on Long Island mm -hmm. or Bethesda Naval Hospital. And the local doctor said, you're not moving him. Well, he was over here for six months. And uh, I'll tell you, when I got out, in order to meet my financial obligations, my wife and I ate a lot of hamburger for a while. <laughs> John, do you remember your medals or citations that you received? Uh, Nothing of any extraordinary factor. I got a Navy letter of commendation, mm -hmm. which is rank-wise equal to the Bronze Star, but they were handed, they were handed some of those things out like donuts. Mm -hmm. Did you ever carry anything for good luck? Yeah, I, nothing but my miraculous medal, which is a Catholic medal. Good. I still have it. Do you remember at any time any entertainers that... Oh, yeah. Uh, the first entertainer we saw overseas was Joe E. Brown. I remember. Put a baseball this long. He was on Guadalcanal. I saw Bob Hope a couple of times. Francis Langford? Uh, yeah. And... Uh, oh, there were others that I... I don't recall right mm -hmm. now. Did you uh, at, at any time have any free time to do any traveling while you're in the service? Where you Especially travel? overseas. I, I overseas, forget it. Yeah, okay. Well, of course, when I was in New Zealand, it was great. Mm -hmm. uh, New Zealand's a marvelous country. If I had to pick a number two spot to live, that would be it. Good. And, uh, well, you know, when I was stationed at Paris Island, and we used to go to Savannah a lot. And, uh, but as far as any extenuating geographical studies, no. <laughs> no, I just meant places you might visit. Any funny stuff or humorous stuff that happened while you're in service? Uh, not really. Okay. Nothing I'd want to say in front of this camera. <laughs> it's okay. They want to know. <laughs> they do. And nothing will be nothing. <laughs> Unless you say so. Yeah. Well, I'll just leave it out. Yeah. Do you, do you belong to any service organizations now, or I belong to the American Legion, the VFW, the Catholic War Vets, and the Marine Corps League. Good. Uh, have you gone to uh, reunions? Oh yeah, my I went to uh, a number of reunions. We had two or three of them in Atlantic City, and uh, then they had a big one in Las Vegas. And I went. My wife was alive then, and she loved to gamble, so she was all for that. <laughs> yeah. Do you uh, keep in contact with any of the guys that you were in the service with? Yeah, there's a couple. Okay. Uh, I call them occasionally. There aren't many left, though. I know, I know. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, they stopped the reunions because of the uh, depreciating numbers. 
at all. What were you doing the day the war ended? I was the, on that airplane. The Second World War. Oh, you were. In the I was on the airplane on the way to Guam. They okay. came over the PA system and told us. Was there a lot of celebrating on the, on the plane? Uh, a few <laughs> smart remarks made. <laughs> okay. Uh, You've done great. Uh, were any of the guys uh, that you knew casualties? Did you see any guys get hit? Were any of the guys wounded? Oh yeah, quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I'll tell you a couple of funny little stories. I met Two guys from Elmira and Guadalcanal, Vic Kruger, now deceased, Frank Novakowski, who was a mailman and transferred to California, I don't know if he's still mm -hmm. alive or not. Then I got down to New Zealand, they were both in the Army, and I met two Marines down there from Elmira, one of whom I went to grammar school with at St. Mary's. Well, how did you happen to know these guys were from Elmira? Just I, I knew them. Oh, okay. I'm standing in a urinal. <laughs> <laughs> right. And this guy walked in, Danny Backer, he's now deceased, yeah. and, and Bernie Riley. They were both in the Marine Air Wing. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me see, who there was somebody else. Well, it's gone. That's okay. Do you, uh, do you still have any of your uniform left? Yeah, I still got my green blouse and uh, I don't know whether I got five yeah I got a pair of trousers but they won't fit anymore <laughs> okay uh, well, most of it you know it's just about how everything how everybody felt about the time you know when the different experiences that they had do you have any photographs uh, when you're in service? I've got one or two because the majority of my photographs went out in the 72 flood. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I had a lot of photographs too. As a matter of fact, we lost all the photographs of our kids when they were young. But thank God for my sister, my wife's family, we, they, all, they all had pictures so they had them copied and gave us copies. Well, any of those things that would apply to, to the time you were in service, even letters. I mean, how was your mail? Did you get mail right along? Oh, yeah. And there was no problem? Email. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'd be a couple of weeks or three weeks. All that stuff is gone. I don't have... Well, I think I've got one email letter that I wrote to my mother. And okay. I saw it in her stuff. Do you, st you still have that? Could we, yeah, I still got it. Could we make a copy of it? Oh, sure. Yeah, anything like that in the photographs, we'd like to make copies of this stuff along with Washington. I'll bring it over. Good, good. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the one picture that I have, uh, the picture of me in uniform, down in New Zealand, at this girl's backyard. Okay. So you had a friend in New Zealand. Oh, that was, they could have left me there forever. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, well, it sounds like you had, I, I couldn't say good time in the service, but you certainly had a lot of experiences. Well, it, it, I, I like the Marine Corps. Uh, of course, there were times I've had a couple of COs and one first sergeant I thought were jerks, mm -hmm. but you're going to run into that any place. Right. So, but uh, the spirit of the Marine Corps is outstanding. And, uh, so you, you trained guys that went to Korea? Yeah. I'll tell you what was disheartening was, you know, I'd have a recruit platoon, zoom, they're gone. And within three or four months, somebody said, say, did you hear about Joe Blow? He got waxed. That was the expression I used. And a, a little tough when you have, uh, you know, these young lads, but that's the way it goes. Was there any different feeling between the guys, like when you were in 
as a young Marine from compared to the guys that were went to Korea. No, not no. really. Same feeling. Yeah. Okay. I would have been there except if they hadn't transferred me. We age-wise, you you would have. Well, I see. I was only 28 when I got out. See, I was. I went in when I was 17. Yeah, I wondered when I saw the dates. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so you must have had parental permission. Well, yeah, well, well, my dad was dead. I just told my mother I want to join the Marines. She yeah, says, she... "When you get out of high school." <laughs> okay. Did anything the Marine training, your experience you had in the service, apply to your uh, after service life? No, uh, nothing other than the details of doing your job. So, in other words, when you were a drill instructor, you had to maintain a very strict schedule. You mm -hmm. had to maintain records and everything else. What time did you get up in the morning? 4.30. What time did you go to bed at night? About 10. Hard day. Four, you know, I still wake up at uh, 5.15, 5.30. Mm -hmm. I used to get up at 4.30, hit the shower, put my uniform on, go in the squad bay where the recruits were, and flick all the lights on and start yelling. <laughs> out! They loved you. <laughs> if they didn't get out fast enough, I'd make them do it over again. Anything you think of that you want to add to all this stuff? Well, I think that just about covers my Marine Corps career. Yeah, well, even, you know, afterwards, uh, uh, yeah, any citations or, or, or medals? Just I mean, that one I told you about, the Navy commendation, mm -hmm. which uh, I often said the guy that wrote that up would have made a Great fiction writer. Yeah. Now the boats that were used on landings. Yeah, and LCVPs. Did they use Higgins boats? That's a Higgins boat. A Higgins boat. That name came about because the Higgins shipyard in New Orleans are the ones that designed them, and they had LCVPs and LCTs. LCVP stood for Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. The front rack came out. When we went to Guadalcanal, they had no ramp. You had to roll over the side. I had heard that. Yeah. And land in the water up to here, you know. And the LCTs were nothing more than a larger craft that uh, they could stick a couple of tanks on. The uh, you should have seen the ones the Japanese had. Oh boy. Well, tell us. They were. They were terrible. Hmm. They had a jeep. The Japanese were they're very clever people, but they also were a little bit stupid about some things. As an example, their trucks they had overseas were carbon copies of a General Motors engine. Mm -hmm. So when they abandoned one, they'd fire one round through the carburetor. Well, all we had to go was take it off and put, we had spare carburetors and they fit. I'll be darned. But they, uh, they had a Jeep, which was a joke. <coughs> it had fins on the tires. And it was, it, uh, it uh, ran on alcohol. Really? What alcohol? It got a flat road like this. They could go 60 miles an hour. You get a two degree incline and they'd almost come to a halt. But I can recall over on Tinian, one day we're up on this ridge and I'm looking down and it was probably three or four hundred yards away. Here's, here's this Japanese Jeep going down. So this kid with me had a Browning automatic rifle and I said, you got any incendiaries? He says, yeah. I says, throw a clip in there. 
I said, hit that guy right behind the driver's seat because that's where they put the tank, right back here. He fired one burst and the thing blew up. Incredible. <laughs> that was the end. <laughs> it was a pretty good sized weapon. Probably. <laughs> It was. It took a big guy to carry that too. No. Yeah. The. Uh, they had a suicide boat. that was. They had a 55-gallon drum of picric acid in the bow. The Japanese. And a guy would, would just lay down on it. And of course, it was supposed to be. They were supposed to ram it into something. I don't. I don't think they were very successful with it. Did, you must have seen kamikazes. Oh boy, when we went to Okinawa, they were all over the place. As a matter of fact, the ship I was on, we were supposed to land at Buckner Bay, and you know, as, as the uh, things progressed, they started holding back the units they were going to send in. So we started drifting up towards the ultimately wanted, landed at a town called Nago. But uh, these kamikazes came over and I was a sergeant then, they said, all right. I don't think people know what kamikazes were. Beg pardon? Some people don't know what kamikazes were. Well, kamikazes were, I, I don't know what the literal translation of the word is, but it was something that the, uh, the Japanese in their spirit of Bushida, which is nothing more than their personal vow to die for the emperor, mm -hmm. but they, the kamikazes, they would take young pilots and all they taught them to do was to take off and steer it. It was a one-way trip to the rising sun. And uh, but I can remember one time there was 300 in the air at one time. So anyway, we were up there and all everybody had to go below. Three. I was a sergeant, there was a couple of us sergeants, and we had to make sure they stayed down there. And I'm watching, and one of them went right over the top of us. And there was a, uh, a uh, Navy tanker, mm -hmm. a small one, probably about eight or nine hundred yards off Mark Port Beam, and man, he hit that thing and that blew sky high. They, uh, I, I read that they trained 4,000 of those people. Of course, I completely concurred with uh, President Truman's decision to drop the atom bomb because it not only saved a lot of American lives, but it saved a lot of Japanese lives because I went to a critique after the war at Quantico, Virginia, where they explained uh, the Japanese plans for the defense of the homeland. And uh, they'd have probably had women under arms, but uh, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been easy. And they planned on, the Americans planned on landing, if I were, seven or eight divisions. And uh, the Marines would have gone in first? Well, no. They, they would have, uh, I can remember seeing in this sketch, there were three divi Marine divisions on the left side of the landing area, and I think there was four or five army uh, over on the right side. And I'm sure the casualty figures would have been horrendous. Did you ever have any clashes with the sailors when you were in the Marine Corps? Clashes? Well, you know. No, we got a lot. You know, when when everybody's shooting, they forget that baloney. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that is peacetime inter-service rivalry, but when people start to die, they forget it. Okay. Now, my association with the Navy was so like when I was aboard that uh, heavy cruiser, and when they they were the coxswains on mm -hmm. the landing craft we went on, they and the Coast Guard. You, <laughs> uh, do you remember the day that they dropped the, the atomic bomb at Hiroshima, where you guys were? I can't 
Yeah. I couldn't even tell you the date. It was in, in August sometime. Right. But I was just trying to think where I was when we heard it. I think it was. I think I was still on Okinawa. Uh, anything else you want to real recollect, think about? Well, an after-service uh, function that I've been with is uh, I've been the drill instructor and leader of the drill team in the Marine Corps League, and uh, which I'm very proud. Although my numbers are beginning to wane a little bit because. Uh, Everybody's getting too fat or crippled up. <laughs> We've got, uh, as a matter of fact, on the 7th, the Vietnam group is having a special ceremony up at the uh, Warplane Museum and they ask us to bring our color guard up. And then Saturday, we got to bury a Marine Colonel over at St. Peter and Paul's Cemetery, McGill. And we'll go over there and fire for that. Now, do you take part in parades? At oh, all? yeah. Okay. As a matter of fact, I have been uh, personally thinking about, I'll just do the training, the marching. I crushed my heel and ankle about eight years ago, and it's beginning to give me fits now. <laughs> and last year, the parade we had in Ithaca just about floored me. Mm -hmm. What was the occasion? For the, Big part? What was the occasion for they, the, in Ithaca for the parade? Well, they have uh, the uh, Veterans Day parade on the Sunday before or after Veterans Day. Okay. It's the last one we participate in. We do about seven parades a year. Really? So you're pretty active. The, uh, well, there's about, we have about 20 guys on the drill team. Mm -hmm. Uh, the biggest problem is trying to get younger people. Uh, well, in the first place, they're raising a family, and they sure don't want to leave a job. Mm -hmm. They go to a parade or a funeral detail if they can get out of it. So, as a matter of fact, I called ten guys this morning uh, regarding the firing squad we have to have Saturday, and uh, every one of them is retired. Did you bring any trophies back? Trophy? Oh, yeah. So? Uh, you mean from these parades? No, 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 from when you were in the service. Oh, you mean uh, trophies? You mean souvenirs? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think they all went out in the flood, too. <laughs> I had I had a uh, Guadalcanal, the Solomon's Islands are part of the Micronesia, mm -hmm. and I had a mahogany war club that this chief we had one of the the natives over there were acting as our scouts, mm -hmm. and this one native I did know his name at one time, but I don't know. He uh, got hit in the back of the leg with a piece of shrapnel, and I bandaged it up and took him to the corpsman. And about two weeks later, he and his father came down and presented me with this club. And uh, all it was probably, I'll say, like '53 or '54. Mm -hmm. I got a phone call from a major at the Marine Museum in Quantico, Virginia. He said, we've got word that you have a Micronesian war club. He said, uh, could we borrow it? I said, I'll do one better than that. I said, I'll give it to you. So we were going on vacation to Fairfax, Virginia. So. I went over there. Well, you talk about the royal treatment. How nice. And the wife, the four kids, took us in the officers' club, gave us a beautiful luncheon. And he said, Well, we have no money to buy anything. He said, We got a lot of goods to barter with. He says, uh, uh, Took me out back. Oh, you should have seen the stuff they had. Okay. He said, 
you want a uh, tank, <laughs> Korean mortar and all that. Anyway, I walked out of there. At that time I was very active in the Boy Scouts. I walked out with three Marine Corps 22s, a bag of spare parts, and a brand new M1 sniper's rifle. And they gave me the paperwork. Well, I was down to the museum two years ago, and I said, where is my war club? Well, the guy told me, he says, we have more stuff in storage than we have on display because we don't have enough room. And they had Quonset huts, mm -hmm. large Quonset huts. They had about four or five of them, and a couple of airplanes they had were just sitting out in the weather. But they're building a brand new, called the Marine Heritage Foundation. And uh, which, of course, they tapped me for a donation. <laughs> but that'll be open in another year. And he says, we'll have everything on display. I said, well, if it isn't, I want it back. Now, whereabouts will this be now? In Quantico. Quantico, okay. Which is 39 miles south of Washington. All right. If you ever, you can, anybody can win there. Beautiful post. Open to the public. Good. That's about it. That's about it? I have nothing else to add. Well, I bet you'll think of something later. Big part? Uh, you'll think of something later. Oh, yeah. I'll bring those pictures over. Do we'd appreciate it. We'd only keep them for a week. Yeah. We'll make copies and get them right back to you. All right. Yeah. Hey, let me see it again. Especially if you got the photographs of you in uniform. I, I got that photo. What was the other thing we were talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh, V-mail. Yeah, yeah, that is very interesting. If you have the envelope, the whole works. That well, would be good. There was no envelope for V-mail. Oh, fold it up and open it up. Right. If you, you have a scrap of paper, I write on there, uh, photo and V-mail, and I won't forget. Okay. I don't. Looks like right up, up there by the computer. It looks like a small pad. Oh, down, 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 right. down. This down. is what we'll down. I will use it. Then you'll have a phone number. This is this. Okay. 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 Make a point of dropping that off. Well, there's no no hurry, because uh, uh, Heather will be here most any time, and, uh, or leave it at the desk with her name on it or something to say yeah. it's for Heather. Here, yeah. uh, would you do it again? Yeah, I'd probably make a few changes, but <laughs> what would you do different? Well, the first thing I'd probably do would be. I would, well, I would still go in the Marine Corps and go in at the, the same way, but I was encouraged during the war to apply for Navy V-12 training, mm -hmm. which was a program where they sent you, you'd come back to the States and send you to college for two years, and from there to OCS. And like a knothead, I said, no. I want to stay with the outfit. <laughs> what was a 90-day wonder? Well, that that really is an army expression, but it's a, a lieutenant whose OCS training was 90 days. Of course, you know, during the war, I'll give you an example of how things change. I went through boot camp, it was 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. During the war, they got down to six weeks. They needed bodies, and uh, I can remember right after the war, they went back up to 12 weeks. Korea broke out, the first thing they did was cut it to eight weeks. They, uh, I, I, know, I know a guy from Horseheads who was one of the guys that was in 
going through boot camp for six weeks. And I says, oh, you got on-the-job training. He says, yeah, you better learn it or you aren't going to be around long. A friend of mine went to Korea, Marine, and he said the stuff that we had was like World War II old stuff. Oh, yeah. 1944. Yeah. But you got to remember something. When we, when we went to Guadalcanal, the 1st Marine Division was armed with Springfield bolt-action rifles from World War I. I have heard that. Which were... Very so accurate. People don't know that stuff. They were very accurate. As a matter of fact, the Marine Corps, right up until, well, mm -hmm. maybe now, but I know right into Vietnam, were using Springfield 03s as sniper rifles. They were, because they were, they were more accurate than the M1 mm -hmm. or the AR-15 or the M16. So, and a, a sniper, his. Uh, dictating factor is one round. He's going to shoot somebody with one round. Okay. Well, if I think of anything else between now and the time I come back to Heather, I'll let you know. Okay. Well, thank you. That's right. great. Oh. Now, you better turn it off. Out. I will just let it run out. Thank you. That my, was very my, nice. My pleasure. Well, good.